Hi, Anna. <clears throat> hey, Elaine. Hi. Hi, Anna. I think Asa is here too. Hi, Asa. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hi, Asa. Anna. Hi, David. Anna. David. And Elaine. Love, love that high tech background you've got, Asa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, not He's so silly. <laughs> you probably figured out how I rigged it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I I uh I got a call from um what she, Sarah Beth texted me. She was out of town for a birthday and became ill. Mm. So um have we set up uh, who is doing what? Uh, let me see. Uh, David, you are the uh, facilitator, right? No. No. Uh, Rosa, this is, it's Rosa's gig, uh, along with Asa and um, their guest, uh, Stephen. Um, and I, I don't know who among us is going to take the lead and we have I don't believe we talked about that but um it can be me um I guess we hadn't but in terms of uh Olive's role have we talked yeah. about that uh I don't know Olive have we <laughs> um not necessarily I, I am just sending out the the link and stuff beforehand and letting people in and just hanging out for the conversation before and after. Um, we okay. talked with the library folks um, and we had the understanding that Asa was facilitating for some reason, or Lisa did, and Asa. So I guess whoever's prepared. <clears throat> Does that sound right to you, Asa? You're muted. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure if that was coming from you all or, or where it came from, but I'm happy to. So I was planning on facilitating, but I wasn't sure if that also included the like welcome introduction part. Um, so I'm prepared to kind of, you know, introduce the conversation and hand it over to Rosa and uh, Stephen. But um, do you want me to take it from the very top as well. Uh, that's, I'll leave that up to you. Do, you. do you feel comfortable doing that or would you prefer I do a couple of things and then hand it to you so you can hand it to somebody else? <laughs> um, I think if there's any um, housekeeping stuff that needs to be taken care of, I don't know um, if I'm on top of that, but yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah <laughs> maybe a, a maybe David double, can just do it double handoff outside. Oh, yeah, and we'll talk more tomorrow about how we're going. So yeah, that sounds good. So then, uh, one thing I want to mention is next week, which unbelievably is November. So Elaine, it's you and Amiri, and is there someone else? Yes, there's a third individual and Lisa has all of that information and the bio so I'll be facilitating next week right but um, I, just in terms of the announcement uh at the beginning uh, today uh -huh. when I say you know so next week we'll have Elaine and Mary and oh. is that good enough and and the title is just on reparations yeah it actually was um Shoot. Yeah, reparations is fine. Okay. Um, <coughs> yeah, that's fine. Are there other announcements uh, that I need to be sure and make at the beginning? Hi, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Hi, Lisa. Anna, can you think of any other announcements that? Um, I was looking at, uh, no, I think we're good. Uh, students, success rates and technology. I don't think so. 
Okay. So this will be super easy. Yeah, that's right. Um, cool. By the way, Lisa, you have everything you need, the bios and names for, for next week. Because Amiri said he sent. Yeah, you I already have Amiri's bio. Right? Yeah, I think I think we're good. Okay. Olive's gonna fix it up, but I think all the stuff, all the text is in there. Okay. And, and Lisa, do you recall the it, it's Elaine and, and Amiri and the name of the third person? You don't recall. Okay. No, but it's in the we have their info. Okay. Um and David, you saw the email I sent to Sophia. So I know you'll follow up because she's um she gets inundated. So if we don't hear yeah. from her, I'll just I, I I will. Uh, I'm I was uh, gone for a few days, and so I'm, for you. Yeah. I'm I'm rather scattered <laughs> by uh, or inundated. Oh, better, Can you hear me? A lot of a lot of requests. So versus what, what test sound? I wrote the yes. We can hear you. We we can hear you, Rosa. Welcome, Rosa. Thank you. I can hear you now, and I can, and you, and I've been heard. So that's a nice thing. Yes, we cannot see you, but we. Now can. you are gonna see me. Yes, you're gonna see me. Ah. Oh, look at that. Huh? I'm in the Facebook server. Yeah, you, you and Asa uh, are doing like <laughs> different. You you've upgraded your computer system, Rosa. <laughs> No, not really. I, I, I'm using a laptop that, that is less less old than my desktop, just for today, because it's more reliable for this kind of connection. Well, I was, I was trying to make a joke about your background. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so I just tested, so we're waiting. Hi, Asa, how are you? Rosa, I'm, I'm doing well. How are you? You have a much more neutral background. Uh, yes, this is my high tech virtual background called a sheet. <laughs> <laughs> it does sort of mimic process in a way with the lines you can see. Oh, that's good. <laughs> They're very coordinated. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So uh, David is going to hand it off to me, and then I'll hand it off to you, Rosa. Yes, we're going to jump from one mind to another. Yes. Everyone enjoying the rain? I am. Um... As long as my roof doesn't leak, yes. Yeah, the, both both of the last winters had major leaks in the in the roof. So the, the yeah. land the landlord tries to find the cheapest possible way of <laughs> dealing with that. So we'll see how it goes this year. Hey, David, or whomever, can you make all of a co-host, please? I, it's not letting me do it. Sure, I'll do it. Thank you. And Olive said they will let people through the door. So oddly, I'm not able to do that either. Can anyone do that? Anna, can do you, since you you were probably here first. We should all be able to do it though, because aren't we all hosts of this? Um, what was it? I'm sorry. We're trying to make Olive a co-host, but I don't have that option. Olive a co-host. Uh, yes. Got it. Terrific. Thank you. Sure. I'll just be... just to know, guys, when when you have multiple hosts, yeah, and and one of them is the first one to join, that's the one that is going to have this situation, right? Yeah. So let's let's take note of that, Asa, for tomorrow. 
whoever jumps first is like a, the the pro host. <laughs> okay, sorry guys for interrupting. So who wants to go in first? But then can you give? But Anna, you could give make someone else the host, right? Um, who wants to be the host? <laughs> I think I'm because I joined first. That's why I become host, right? Yeah, that's fine. Asa. Yes. Very worst case scenario when we depend on third parties. You never know. So mm. if Steven doesn't show up for any reason, for any reason, so I think it would be good for us to, to, to have like a, like, like a presentation, interactive presentation of the, of the topics of their website. Ah, okay. Because that's how relationship with them started. So I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not particularly paranoid, but I'm always thinking about what is the plan B, C, and D. Yes. Just and... in case. Have you heard from him since we met? No, but he was very excited uh, last week. Yeah. So let's see. Yes. Yeah. It's amazing we... what they, the work that they are doing is amazing. So we can show it off. Yeah, we've, we've still got two minutes. <laughs> no reason to panic. You look deep in thought, Elaine. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. You also look like really 1973, which I, I like. Mm. You look great. Oh, great. Thank you. Did, did any of you all see that uh, special on the Civil War yesterday? It's worth a watch. Where did you watch it? It was a special uh, MSNBC uh, produced by Henry Lu Louis Gates and Brad Pitt. Mm. You know. Did they talk about reconstruction? Yeah, reconstruction, the Civil War, views of folk from the South, uh, from young people to older people, holding on to that legacy, really. Definitely, uh, I'll have to view it again, but uh, it's worth seeing. Kende was on there too, David. They talked yeah. to him, yeah. A few others out of Howard and... Cool, I got to meet uh, Henry a couple of months ago. Oh. And yeah, and he spent the whole time calling me that professor. Every time he referred to me, he says, that professor. What, what, <laughs> so, were, what was the event or circumstance? It was, it was at a friend's house. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Skip. Skip and that professor. <laughs> <laughs> he was, was he being funny? Uh, yeah, who knows? Uh, I... I'm sure that at least on its surface, it had humor. Was he aware of Antioch at all? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, it's 4 p.m. Do we wanna wait for Stephen to come or let people in? Um, that's a good question. I wanna ask, uh, Rosa, do you, are you able to text Stephen? You're on. Rosa, mute. You're, yeah. you're on mute. You're still on mute, Rosa. So you're going to try to text him. And I also tell him, Olive, that I'm trying to get in the. Uh, here, he here he is. Here he is. Here he is. Here he is. Okay. Uh, so pull the plug, Olive. Okay. Hi, Steven. Hi there. How are you? Oh, Kirsten's here. 
So good, good rainy uh, afternoon, at least if you're in Los Angeles, a beautiful rainy day. Um, we're going to wait uh, one more minute as uh, people join us. I think the rain has affected the traffic on the 405. And so let's give people a little bit more time to get here. Um, and then we'll start. <laughs> There are new regulations for don't zoom and drive at the same time. Don't drive under the influence of zoom. Hi, everyone. Hi, hey, Kirsten. I don't know. I get how how is it that I get let in early? You're not in early. Oh. <laughs> your, your privileges have been revoked. <laughs> All right. Well, in the interest of time, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, again, good afternoon. I'm David Tripp, uh, core faculty at the Antioch Los Angeles uh, campus. Um, and I just have a couple of pieces of business before I hand it uh, things over to Asa Wilder. Um, first up is just uh, uh, to, to thank you for uh, coming and participating in this ongoing series of messy conversations uh, about uh, race, uh, racial injustice, and uh, anti-racism. Um, next week, um, our, it'll be November, which is hard to believe, uh, but our uh, topic will be on uh, reparations and uh, Elaine Parker Gills and uh, Amiri, who many of you will uh, remember, will be joining us uh, for a conversation around that. In terms of just uh, practical uh, issues, um, this is being recorded. If you uh, don't want uh, to be identified as part of this uh, recording, um, you can turn off your video uh, you can also change uh, your name uh, to something that no one would recognize. So uh, feel free to do that. Um, unless you've been called upon to, uh, to offer uh, comments, which will happen in the second half of our time together today, please keep yourself on mute. It helps the sound quality uh, enormously. And uh, we strongly encourage you to use the chat function to uh, post any questions or comments that you have um, somewhere around 4.30, a little after, um, we'll, uh, we'll start fielding those comments and, and, uh, and giving you an opportunity to present your questions and comments to uh, our conversationalists today. So with that, I'll hand things off to uh, Asa Wilder. Thank you, Asa. All right, thanks, thanks David. Thanks everyone. Um, it's uh, an honor to be joining the Messy Conversations again. Um, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. We are um, really lucky to be joined um, by a native Angelino, Steven Randeros, who is the executive director of uh, Media Justice, which is a national racial justice hub fighting for a future in which all people of color are connected represented and free. Um, he's led a number of high profile initiatives like the campaign for prison phone justice and uh, which lowered the cost of prison phone calls nationwide. And he's also led efforts to win the nation's strongest net neutrality rules and blocked the merger of Comcast and Time Warner and pressuring Facebook to ban white nationalists on their platform. So welcome and thanks for joining us, Stephen. Thank you. Um, of, of course, we are also joined by Rosa Garza Marino, who you may know, um, has an MA from uh, in Media and Cultural Studies, is a transdisciplinary scholar, educator, and academic administrator driven by curiosity and difference. Um, she's currently serving on the AULA UGS division as both part time faculty and director of external academic partnerships in charge of the internship program, community engagement initiatives, and articulation liaison with two-year local colleges. 
also the volunteer chair of the AOLA Diversity Inclusion Committee. So, hello, Rosa. Hi. Thank you, Isa. And um, I'm the reference and instruction librarian at AULA. I don't know if I mentioned that already, but <laughs> um, so thanks for joining us. And uh, this special messy conversation is part of Antioch's participation in U.S. Media Literacy Week, uh, which is hosted by the National Association for Media Literacy Education and UNESCO's Media and Information Literacy Alliance. And the mission is to really highlight the power of, of media literacy education and raise awareness, raise awareness about its importance. So the, the theme for US Media Literacy Week this year, it celebrates one of the five components of media literacy's definition each day. Uh, that is access, analyze, evaluate, create, and act. And so throughout the week, we'll have a number of other events and activities and resources to share. And I'm going to post a link now in the chat uh, with more details about uh, what's coming up this week. So with, um, with today's theme being access, we thought this was a great opportunity to partner with Messy Conversations and approach this issue of media literacy through the lens of race and media justice. So in the second half, we really want to open up this conversation and hear from all of you, uh, especially about the challenges and the barriers that you've experienced uh, with access to media. So if you can start thinking of those, um, we would love to have your contributions. And um, so please type your, your questions and comments in the chat and we'll get to them uh, when the conversation opens up more. So to say a bit more about how all of this came together and to really frame the issues that we'll be talking about and get us started, I will uh, hand it over to Rosa. Thank you, Asa. Thank you again, everyone, for being here, sharing these topics. Uh, and uh, again, part of the context, I wanted to share that uh, that we ended up here with the, the support of Mark uh, Howard, our provost, and uh, and me, he Hume from Undergraduate Studies, the involvement of the library. So this has been a very interesting collaboration. I wanted to emphasize that the collaboration to make room for us in the middle of a very busy schedule of messy conversations. And then welcoming us in this space just to match the media literacy week so it's really appreciated that uh and um and the other component here is that a little story uh, uh bear with me with this tiny story because it's a, it's a I spent my summer class uh, about uh, the digital, the analysis of digital media and critical media analysis uh, with students, and we visited very frequently a wonderful website, right? A wonderful web website for a place called Media Justice, and then we were dealing with this place with the initiatives uh, of activism and the examples of amazing, amazing intervention with the pressing issues of the media today. And my students were fascinated and learning a lot from that. And uh, when I saw the Media Literacy Week coming and the opportunity to talk about access, precisely access and justice and race, uh, I reached out randomly out of the blue to Stephen Renderos. Like, Hi, we have been observing your website. Uh, I am nobody, but, uh, but we care about what you are doing. And, and, and suddenly we had, he, he got interested in us and in this in participating today with us. So I, I just want to acknowledge that generosity that Stephen being here, right? So that's my tiny story. And, uh, and just bear with me a little bit more. I, I would like to provide other kind of context, which is the context of, of the actual uh, messy situation of the media today. <laughs> Very appropriate. So uh, just quickly before handing it to, 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 uh, to Stephen, uh, because I would like to point out uh, basically areas of concern uh, and then uh, as many areas of concern that exist and struggles, there's also intervention and activism. There's amazing, extraordinary work being done. So I wanna point out uh, issues uh, and uh, I'm, I'm posting on the chat uh, three main topics that, that the areas of concern that I would, uh, let me see how. This is an idea. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna be covering these three, three areas very very quickly. Uh, so um, the issues when you think about access and the media, then you can think in terms of uh, the promise of connectivity, interactivity, and and the content curation we're we're living right now. Uh, first of all, uh, we are in an environment uh, that we can define, and scholars define that as a predatory economy. That's where we are living right now. A predatory economy that is living off sucking and sucking of uh, value from every single opportunity uh, in the digital world, that the world which is uh, networked. So it's very easy to, to have this predatory activity of taking over a value from everything, pretty much like the colonies used to do before. So now the colonies are our own minds and ideas, right, individually. Um, so that's one, one point uh, important. So race and class discrimination that has always traditionally happened with the media is now being amplified and exacerbated in the context of the digital environment. So it's, 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 uh, the intersection of race and media justice is it, just translate, trans, has been transported or translated and rendered, replicated in the world of the, of the, of the media and the, and the internet. Uh, before the internet, uh, uh, they were, when we talk about access as a scholar and a, as, as a teacher and with my colleagues, when we talk about access before the internet, media access, you would, you would address basically two issues, like ownership and, and, uh, and representation. Ownership is that there's a monopoly going on. What's going on with the concentration of owners here? Uh, and then the other issue was uh, representation. So there's a, there's a, there's, there's this, uh, re, um, propagation of stereotypes and misrepresentation of communities and particularly focusing on the most vulnerable, the ones that you have marginalized from having a voice. So then you further abuse that, that, that aspect. So you have that, those two elements, right? Ownership and representation before the internet. Now with the internet, uh, what you have is, is this issues of uh, the abuse is going further because with connectivity, for example, you have the, the issues of monopolies that are uh, really uh, unregulated. Every single topic that I'm gonna address right now is primarily unregulated. It's like the wild west. Right? So it's unregulated. So very new things happening, so took us by surprise to all of us. Uh, scholars are alarmed too about this. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's unregulated and it's new and unregulated. So uh, we have the monopolies uh, that are creating uh, like a, a market segregation uh, of, of people so that if you don't have enough money to pay for, for better connectivity, then, then you are gonna be uh, left uh, out with a, with a very different kind of connection, with a different kind of experience, uh, hosting services, web hosting services, mobile services. Then you have the equipment costs that is it's not that cheap to have a good equipment, uh, but then uh, these been uh, people without with low low lower level earners are going to have a problem with having up to date equipment, uh, and then you have uh, the equipment uh, you run out of uh, of, of uh, modern equipment very quickly. This is obsolete, rendering obsolete uh, technology. So you create a lot of toxic waste and that goes to the backyard of people of color uh, uh, and, and people that, that have uh, been in that, that, that situation already being the target of everything that is discarded. So that's another element that is out there. And then you have the, the element of, um, Oh, labor to make cheap uh, to make to make uh, equipment that you need cheap labor from other countries or other places with an, the additional waste, uh, etc. So uh, the the toxic element of, of just the physical aspect of this environment is is uh, is, is the other issue that is out there. And uh, and finally, in terms of this connectivity, we have this. Let me put it here like this uh, attachment to these things. I hope you see like yeah. So we have this gadget dependency today that make us uh, convinced that we need to be totally connected to those uh, elements, uh, and and uh, and then we we would strive to be there. So people that have marginalized with little resources, uh, and they become these these segregated communities would be really trying striving to be up to date with equipment and and gadgets that that is just keeping them like I think this, this sense of being, uh, you know, segregated. The, the, as far as interactivity, just bear with me a couple of more minutes about activity. We have this uh, clutter uh, of, of media content that anyone can post, right? Anyone can post. It doesn't matter what authority might, might have. Anyone can post, create, 
create clutter and clutter is the paradise for for this predatory economy because they, they get through surveillance that is the digital world creates surveillance like every step every every footprint that we have in the in the in the content and the media environment these days in our interactions with them are, are, are uh, subject to surveillance because they're going to be translated into a data extraction so that data is going to be valuable merchandise for advertisers valuable merchandise for uh, political pollsters to know what are our habits and what are our, our preferences so you have the, the the holy grail in the 50s when publicity or advertising industry was just like a like this genius kind of industry was being born in the 30s 40s 50s the, the holy grail there was how can i get into the head of, of the people so that I know exactly how to sell them this particular thing. That was just the, the, the dream. Uh, and then now it came through, uh, it's here, and it has serious consequences in terms of, of the, the invasion of privacy, the surveillance, stuff like that. And that's just the interactivity element. Like we became creators, uh, co-creators of media. It's not just the media coming top down to us. That's the other way around too. But it creates all this environment where, where we uh, unadvertently, uh, we are being uh, like extracted value from us. And the final one is automated uh, content curation. The curation of content, it means that uh, there's you audiences now segregated differently. So the access element here that affects people, it affects uh, especially marginalized communities would be uh, that, that we are placing, depending on our preferences, we are now placing echo chambers. And the echo chambers are, are the ones that, that um, artificial intelligence is giving us access to particular information and, and limiting access to other kinds of information. So basically we are locked up in a world where uh, where we have information that is gonna mirror exactly what we want to hear. So the multiple perspectives, the single story is, is gonna be always part of our bubble. Uh, so that's, that's another concern that is out there. Uh, we are not clear anymore about what the source really is. It's a, it's, it's an, uh, it's a, it's a bot, like it's an automated message, uh, but a robot, uh, artificial intelligence, or it's, a, it's an opinion leader, or it's a celebrity, or it's a deep fake uh, 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 persona that is out there because of the technology and media is facilitating those possibilities. Uh, and there's no moderation of content. OK, um, no moderation of content. There's a huge distortion, and I'm sure we all share this element of concern that is a huge distortion of, of the First Amendment. So it seems that now we are into the freedom to hate, freedom to, to deceive, freedom to troll, and, and freedom to uh, obfuscate reality and uh, gaslight everyone around us. So it's. Uh, that, that First Amendment is totally distorted at the moment, uh, and, and uh, other countries have different versions of what, what freedom of speech means, but in our case, this is what seems to be happening. And, um, and, it's, and it's that this discourages digital citizenship and again affects communities of color. They, if anyone needs a voice, in every, everyone that has been historically marginalized needs a voice, needs a presence, and needs to take ownership and practice agency and be out there is, is precisely these communities. And those are the ones that are being <laughs> like a further lock up in these bubbles and in this situation or being bullied or being, uh, you know, so it's just, uh, that's, that's part of the scenario. So I don't want to depress anyone because the good news is that, that there's activism out there, right? There's that struggle and there's activism there. And with that, I'm gonna stop monopolizing the conversation, Stephen. So, because. All right. Well, now that you've gotten them thoroughly depressed, let me go ahead and <coughs> um, and apologies. I've been uh, I've been on Zoom calls all day, so my, I'm feeling my voice coming out. But um, I'll do my best to to talk. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I think by way of context, and there's a lot that you raised in in your three pieces across connectivity, interactivity, and content curation that we could go a little bit further down on, but I guess what I wanted to root it in is a little bit of context for us as an institution, media justice. Um, you know, media justice as an institution, but also as a framework, as a political framework, um, has been around for about 20 years. Um, the, the idea for media justice really emerged out of a gathering that happened um, at the Highlander Research Center uh, back in 2002. 
Um, and for folks that you know are familiar with Highlander, you want you kind of know its history and in, in the wider kind of civil rights movement as being kind of a, a convening space um, to bring uh, different activists and, and thought leaders together. And, um, you know, so media justice uh, was conceived at a gathering like that in 2002 that brought together media activists that were um, wrestling with some of the challenges around media at that time, you know, which this was in the early 2000s. This was post the 1996 Telecom Act that had, and post a lot of the deregulatory um, policies of the Reagan administration in the 80s. So this was following a couple decades of just steady deregulation in an industry that led to, you know, concentrated ownership and that led to, you know, the, the kind of lack of diverse voices uh, on the air. So that, those were the conditions that I think those activists were dealing with at that time. Um, you know, and, and a lot of the, the main monsters that they were fighting were big mega companies like Clear Channel that were at that time purchasing all of the radio stations across the country. And one of the groups, which was a youth media organization based in Oakland called Youth Media Council, which would later become Media Justice, um, was fighting a local campaign to try to prevent the last kind of independently owned hip hop station from being sold off to Clear Channel. Um, but there were activists there from Austin, from Chicago, from New York City, um, from all over the country who were struggling with their kind of independent kind of fights in their local communities. Um, but what didn't exist was like a real space of like alignment and collaboration among those different groups. They kind of, they fought the same people, but they operated in, in isolation from each other. Um, the other thing that was happening is a lot of the efforts for change at that time um, which were, you know, broadly kind of referred to as like the media democracy space, were largely populated by, you know, well, well-intentioned, well-meaning, but DC-focused um, public interest organizations that were predominantly white-led. So what that led to is a lot of solutions in our media space that didn't quite reflect the, the challenges and the lived experiences that folks on the ground were dealing with. You know, folks were struggling with seeing the last few kind of bastions of local media, local content, diverse content going away because corporations were gobbling up newspapers, TV stations, you know, um, radio stations and the like. Uh, and a lot of the solutions that were primarily, you know, focused in DC weren't really reflecting those priorities. So media justice really emerged as a, as a need for an intervention, a place for people of color to articulate and shape and drive our own solutions in this larger media uh, and tech ecosystem. Um, one of the other things I think that factored in for us was we, you know, a lot of the groups that were part of that convening and subsequently have been a part of our network and, and our work are groups rooted in racial justice movements. And, you know, we understand that, uh, you know, culture plays a very critical function in shaping political conditions. And we believe that cultural change does in fact affect political change. And you can take this as far back as, you know, the Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier in baseball re being a precursor to a lot of the civil rights legislation that we saw moving into the 60s, but also Brown versus Board of Education. There's been moments throughout history in which cultural change has, has created the conditions for real political change. So from that perspective, that's why we fight to change our media and tech system, because we understand that those things shape conditions for us um, that in order to achieve the outcomes that we want uh, on behalf of racial justice movements, you know, equitable outcomes for people of color, we need to be shaping culture um, in, in a very intentional way. So, so that's where kind of media justice comes from and, and that's our context. Um, since we were founded a little over 10 years ago uh, as a national organization, you know, we, We've, our issues have evolved to kind of cover the broad range of things that, that Rosa brought up from, you know, internet access to, um, to you know, uh, algorithmic amplification and kind of digital discrimination um, to surveillance technology being layered into the criminal legal system or, or in prisons. That's always been kind of a, we've kind of evolved to kind of cover all those issues because they, they again, kind of shape the the, the cultural conditions that affect racial justice movements. And I mean, I can go more in depth in, in any one of these um, 
you know, on any number of these issues, which, you know, Asa and Rosa, please let me know which direction you want to take the conversation in. But I just wanted to ground it in that context that as an institution, that's where we came from. I should also say that we also see ourselves as being part of a much longer kind of thread of history in which people of color have tried to shape uh, media conditions around them. And this can go as far back as the, the history of our entire country as a country. Um, you know, the first black newspaper in the United States was the Freedom's Journal. Um, and in their very first edition, this is in 1827, you know, they wrote, we wish to plead our own cause. Far too long have others spoken for us. Um, and, you know, this is in an era that in black newspapers uh, played a very critical role in, in populating ideas of abolition at that time during slavery. Um, so there is a function in which people have utilized media, people of color have utilized media as a means to, to populate ideas, to, to lead to political change. This happened around the civil rights movement and radio and TV, um, you know, uh, the civil rights movement in the 60s was very strategic in how they utilized media to shine a light on the struggles of the Jim, you know, of Black folks struggling and fighting um, the Jim Crow segregation in the South, because it 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 kind of added to the the moral justification for change by shining a light and making visible what was happening. Um, there's a interesting story that a friend of mine wrote in a book called News for All the People that kind of documents some of this history of race and media. Uh, and a story about Dr. King's um, uh, office in Atlanta uh, that was located on the first floor and on the second floor there was a radio station. And uh, literally anytime Dr. King wanted to make an announcement on the radio, he would he had this broom and he would you know, use the broom and hit the ceiling and that would notify the DJs upstairs that, you know, he wanted to make an announcement. So they would lower a microphone down the side of the, the window down to, down to their window. And, you know, they would pause programming and, you know, he'd make a message. So uh, he, he'd deliver a message. So there are these kind of histories in which like very intimately, quite literally uh, interconnected um, any struggle for social and racial justice and media and uh, trying to shape our media system. So, uh, I'm happy to go in whatever direction makes sense from here, but I just wanted to ground it in that context. Yes, thank thank you so much. Um, and that anecdote is it's such like a beautiful example of the power of access, right? Like if you can bang a broom on the ceiling and get access to the radio waves, it makes a difference. Um, and I, I would love to hear, you know, when we open it up, what other people are interested in. You've kind of heard a range of directions we could go in there. And this is such a um, also rapidly shifting time for this issue. I mean, currently there's a lot of legislation around these regulations um, in the works. Um, so I, I was interested in, and maybe Rosa, you could also add in what you wanted to um, address more, but uh, this issue of you know access to the internet and like building actually the infrastructure um so broadband mm -hmm. expansion and how maybe that is tied in with racial justice work uh historically and going forward yeah i mean for us like obviously i think for most of us having all of us who have lived through a pandemic in this past year and a half and over a year and a half have come to realize in very tangible ways how critical it is not having access to um, a tool like the internet. Um, you know, and y'all being a learning community, you know that firsthand, how critical that is to maintain an, an educational environment. And so many millions of kids across the country uh, also found that out the hard way. Um, and there's a, there's a story that came out of uh, Salinas, California uh, last year. I'm not sure if folks saw it, but it was a story of these two young, uh, Latinx girls who were sitting outside of a Taco Bell um, on a computer that was given to them by their school district. Because, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was handing out Chromebooks and hotspots and that sort of stuff. And um, so these kids had the computer, but they didn't have internet access at home. Um, so they had to go to a Taco Bell and sit outside of it to get, you know, get internet access um, for free because they couldn't afford it otherwise. Um, and it's a it's a very it's a very it's a terrible image to have, especially in this country today. Because I think what it demonstrates for me is just a complete failure in delivering a critical infrastructure that people need. Um, 
and a failure at a scale that I'm not sure that in other, in other kind of critical infrastructure, that the rollout of critical infrastructure in our history, that that's really happened at that in this level. And I think there's some key differences about why, but you go back to the electrification of the United States, um, where there were models for delivering this very critical infrastructure to people that ranged from private ownership to cooperative ownership to you know government you know government run infrastructure uh the same thing with with telephones and uh, it's slightly different in the sense that like we allowed for a natural monopoly um to a company like ma bell at t with with the understanding that you could be a monopoly but you had to connect everybody um and, and we didn't do that around the internet, you know, and this, this goes into kind of the deregulatory efforts that happened um, starting around the Reagan administration in the 1980s uh, and moving into the 90s under the Clinton administration and the 96 Telecom Act, this kind of treating this very vital infrastructure or at least an emerging vital infrastructure as a commodity and, and not a necessity. Um, and that was reflected in the attitudes of people at the highest levels of government. There was a, a former uh, chair of the Federal Communications Commission who said of the digital divide, um, this is in the early 2000s, he was like, there's also a Mercedes divide, but you don't see me like, you know, and I, I wish in the sense that like, I, I want a Mercedes, but I can't have one. So there's this, there was this idea that I think populated in the minds of regulators, of, you know, of leaders in government that this was a, a nice infrastructure for those that could afford it, but not, not a necessity. And, and over the last like 15, 20 years, we've learned just how critical it is. And especially over this last year, we realized what happens when the world shuts down and you still need to continue operating. Um, you know, so, so for us, I think it's a, it's a very critical battle, a place where if people of color don't have access to this infrastructure, it not only affects your ability to have a voice, uh, but it definitely affects that. But it also affects your ability to do basic things like get an education, uh, apply for government services. Um, you know, and I found this out the hard way with my mom, who was unemployed for most of the the pandemic. If it wasn't for me, who who knew how to navigate, you know, tools online and navigate the uh, California's unemployment website, like I'm not sure how she would have done it. You know, um, so. So the consequences are, are pretty dire. Um, and, and, and I think the pandemic offered an opportunity or at least a, a view of what happens um, in the worst case scenario. And it really shifted hearts and minds. And I think that story of, of the two kids sitting outside of a Taco Bell, like uh, I sat in a room with a bunch of, or not literally, but virtually sat in a room with a bunch of legislators uh, from California who whose minds were completely shifted in how they thought about this issue because of that story. And these were the same legislators that a year ago, two years ago, were you know, reflecting the talking points of companies like AT&T because they're a very powerful lobby in, in the state of California. Um, you know, and, and we've seen a real kind of mind shift at, at all layers of government. And there's a real unique opportunity, hopefully emerging soon, where Congress is, is considering as part of its infrastructure package, uh, a $650 billion investment or $65 billion investment in the deployment of broadband. Um, and it's, uh, it, what's interesting about it is the money's gonna go to states. The states will get to decide how to spend that money. And that money could go to spend, you know, could be spent to help, you know, anchor institutions like churches or nonprofits or, uh, a public access TV station be its own internet service provider and provide internet to the surrounding community. It can go to help, you know, the state pay for a fiber line to get out to communities that are hard to reach. Like in California, the Central Valley is a is almost a dead zone for that sort of, you know, high speed broadband. Um, there's a real opportunity in this moment to really shift the the the, the model of the business model of, of this this critical infrastructure away from a monopoly duopoly kind of infrastructure where you know Comcast and AT&T get to make choices about where they build out this critical infrastructure and instead really decentralize that in a, in a really unique way and and I think that's really pertinent in this moment because those companies failed us leading into this pandemic um, and they made very strategic choices that failed us like in Oakland um, you know you take a look at 
one of our members in Oakland Green Lining Institute did a study of broadband deployment in Oakland. And when you layer kind of maps of historical redlining, bank redlining over with like digital redlining. So where are the places where the communities don't have access to high-speed broadband? They fit like a glove, you know? In Los Angeles, a, a researcher at USC, Hernan Galperin, did a study of, you know, um, a, you know, broadband access in LA County and overlaid that at the time, this was like in, in the early spring with uh, where were there high vaccination rates, low vaccination rates among, you know, people. And the neighborhoods that were people of color, uh, Latinx, um, you know, black and brown folks were the same places where there was a lack of internet access and there was low vaccination rates, you know. And sure, there, they might, there might be causation that we could argue there, but like there is historical underinvestment that's happened in those communities. And, and in, the internet is only the latest version of that. And there's a real opportunity to, I think, disrupt that. Thank you. Um, Rosa, were, were there any issues you wanted to kind of bring to the forefront again and um, also call on people to post questions in the chat again if you have yeah. or issues you face? Yeah, yeah I, I would like uh, people to help us uh, share their barriers and the areas of intervention that they have discovered, right? Because we, we are not with our arms crossed. We are trying to do something, but look at, at the issues with eyes wide open uh, to, to notice what is going on there and the kind of interventions that are needed. Uh, it's, it's, uh, so I was, I was, I was wondering, uh, so you just, you touched on, on that, uh, Stephen, about uh, this idea of net neutrality Mm -hmm. uh, that that people uh, that, that 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 it was almost passed and then turned down and then passed and right now is 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 in in the process of that. I don't know if if, if you would like to just add anything in that direction or just let people uh, answer questions that we have in the chat. You know? Yeah, for sure. I'm seeing some stuff come in. Thank you for that question, Lisa. Um, yeah, I mean net neutrality is. Uh, I'll tell you ten was it 10 years ago? It was 2009. I remember going to uh, a trip to Washington, DC to meet with a bunch of like public interest organizations to talk about this issue. I had no idea what it meant. It went way over my head. Um, but uh, over time, um, one of the things I, I realized was how critical it was for, for people to be treated equally online. And net neutrality was the thing that guaranteed that. Um, you know, and I think that the historical context, I think about this with, uh, I, think, I think around with net neutrality and for folks that don't know what it is, net neutrality are, are just a set of principles um, that has largely guided the way the internet has evolved. It's, uh, there are some principles about, um, you know, what an internet service provider as a provider of the internet can and can't do. Um, so the main, the key ones are like, you know, no internet, there should be no blocking, meaning no internet service provider should be in a position to say what you can and can't access online. Should be no throttling. So the internet service provider shouldn't like be allowed to just slow down your connection because for any reason, you know, let alone for financial reasons, for financial incentives. Um, they shouldn't be allowed to do paid prioritization where like if you pay, um, you know, to, to pay for access, for faster access to certain websites. Um, so it's this idea that, you know, every bit of information that travels across the internet infrastructure should be treated equally. It's much in the same way that telephones actually work. You know, a telephone, um, uh, your telephone provider, when you pick up and, and dial a phone number um, from, they can't decide because Rosa is calling Steven that I'm going to block that number. Um, you know, and I think that's the, gen the same general principle that applies to net neutrality. Um, but, you know, the historical context I think about is when, when people of color have been guaranteed kind of a, a neutral platform to speak, um, it's led to some interesting innovation and in voices. So go back to the rise of the black press in the 1800s. Um, there was a boom of black newspapers, not because um, that was the thing to do, but because there was real access to do so. Um, so 
you know, the U.S. Postal Service back then was required to to carry and distribute, um, you know, uh, any newspaper at a at a fraction of a cost. So it made the distribution of newspapers, which were very critical to newspapers at that time, way more financially accessible. Um, and so you had, you know, incredible like black newspapers like the Chicago Defender um, that had reach and uh, and readership not just in Chicago, but all over the South. And that was in part because of, uh, you know, the, the lower barrier to cost in terms of distribution, but it was also because, you know, they actually distribute their newspaper through, um, through railroad workers. Um, and a lot of the railroad workers at that time that were traveling down into the South were black. Um, so a lot of those, you know, that literal infrastructure of railroads going into the South uh, helped newspapers, um, you know, gain wider distribution. So there was this kind of equal level playing field that uh, was afforded to them through policy, but also through infrastructure. And today I think about net neutrality in a very similar way with, with people of color and our voice online. Um, when we got involved in net neutrality in, in 2009, 2010, we were one of the very few voices coming from communities of color that were saying, this is actually very important to us. Um, and in fact, a lot of the legacy civil rights organizations at that time um, were echoing the positions of internet service providers. You know, a lot of it, you know, and I, I hate to, to make this connection, but a lot of it had to do with political influence. I mean, they were, they were some of their biggest donors. Um, it wasn't an issue that was widely understood. But one of the things that changed since 2010 to 2016 when net neutrality passed, uh, 2015, um, was that the internet became much more relevant to people. You know, Arab Spring happened during that time period. Um, in the United States, you saw the uprisings out of Ferguson. Um, a lot of the initial uprisings that happened after the, the, the killing of Trayvon Martin. Um, and you saw a online conversation called Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, which started as a hashtag spark into a movement. And, you know, we brought activists um, involved with Black Lives Matter to speak to members of Congress, to speak to the Federal Communications Commission, about how critical that infrastructure was to, to shine a light on a story uh, and on a perspective that's usually not covered by you know, uh, mainstream channels of media and really forcing attention by mainstream channels of media in a way that um, you know, they hadn't really been able to before. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I, I would say, so net neutrality for us continues to be a fight that we're in. Um, it was repealed under Trump. Um, you know, assuming that the Federal Communications Commission can get uh, a fifth commissioner um, on uh, appointed, then they're likely to pass another round of net neutrality rules. Here in California, we're fortunate that, you know, we were part of efforts of passing state legislation, which actually passed the strongest version of net neutrality rules ever passed. Um, and that's in effect now, which is great. Thank you for that. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to pass it over to uh, Lisa had a question um, about who's doing this work around access. Hey, um, I'm, I'm delighted that you are here with us. Thank you so much. And I, you, you touched on this, but which public institutions should be covering this, like with the with the uh, Dust Bowl in the Department of Agriculture taking care of the Okies and camp, like what's the equivalent and and who's absent and what are the politics around this? And I know you've you've touched on this, but yeah, I mean, so sure, sure, like independent agencies, like uh, independent regulatory agencies, like the Federal Communications Commission. When it comes to internet access, that's a that's a key agency in this. The NTIA, which I always forget what they stand for, um, they're more of the administrative arm for a lot of the programs that um, that are going to be rolling out around broadband. Um, so they will they will be administering the money. Um, so they're key, and I think in, in ensuring that they're staffed up properly, which has been a challenge in the first year of the Biden administration um, because of just all the the politics and just the slog um, at the congressional level. Um, but then beyond that, honestly, it's, it's like state and local, um, state, and, state and local players. Cities play a role here. Counties can play a role. States can play a role. In California, um, the governor is setting up like a, essentially like a broadband czar that's going to oversee a lot of the 
kind of innovative solutions they've come up with um, for, for, for this state. Um, so there's a multitude of different players. And in some states, it actually looks very different. They have like broadband task forces. Um, and, but I would say like, I think the governors, um, city councils, I think are key because I think they will be influential voices in deciding how money that's coming to their community around broadband, um, that 65 million I was referencing, 65 billion I was referencing earlier, they'll play a very influential role in that. And I think cities advocating for solutions that don't just line the pockets of Comcast and Verizon and AT&T are going to be really critical. So a place where we're focusing our attention over this next year is building up that advocacy capacity on the ground of activists that are you know, somewhat tangentially connected to this issue. They may not, because for the most part, there aren't a lot of organizations to work on trying to address the digital divide. Um, they do that more as a kind of a service function, right? They're a library that is providing internet access to people or a community technology center, but, you know, not necessarily a group that's doing advocacy around that issue. So part of what we're trying to do is, um, build up the advocacy capacity of groups on the ground so they can better influence those decision makers like city council members and, um, you know, and state elected officials. And we're also working with other national organizations that organize or at least um, uh, are coalitions of, you know, local elected officials and state elected officials to try to, you know, be in greater coordination because it is going to be, it's a great opportunity to, to really shift the landscape, um, but it's really going to require that we have the power to advocate for what we want because internet service providers, and this isn't, this isn't my like tirade on how much I hate Comcast and Verizon and AT&T, which I do, but um, that they're just pragmatically, they're very influential because they spend a lot of money lobbying and they will do everything they can to direct money their way, which, you know, that is, that is their prerogative. Um, so yeah, I think those are some of the key kind of public institutions I would think about. I mean, in libraries for sure, I think in in the past around this issue, they're so critical because they have a finger on the pulse in a way that, um, you know, and in in a widely concentrated way, uh, geographically, you know, in urban centers, in rural communities, they understand what's actually going on. Um, because librarians have unfortunately been pitted to be not just librarians anymore, they're the in many places like the the social service agency so um they're a critical and you know institution in all of this as well I, I so appreciate hearing you say that and you know be wary of the people that say public libraries are not necessary anymore right they do so much that's right mm -hmm. so uh, lisa's the other librarian at aula so yeah that's right let's have a good uh supportive audience here. Um, and uh, I see that Clarence uh, has a question as well. Um, so Clarence, um, hand it off. Hi. Actually, I probably have a statement, but I'm not so sure what focus you guys have taken around media and race. Um, and for me, just listening to what has been shared, um, I appreciate um, you know, Rosa laying out um, the different connections with what, um, you know, the internet and what uh, media does for society at this point. But I think about through my own lens, I'm a person who has worked in media and I'm a person who has had to pursue media. I've been a journalist and I've been a publicist. So as a publicist, I had to learn how the media works in order to serve my clients and working with the media for my clients benefit and as a journalist i of course have you know written for and um done broadcasts um production around you know general um um areas but what i sit here and realize and you know i always say this right now moment because that's what john lewis used to say but we witness the George Floyd situation through media. And when I say through media, through the public journalists on the street because of this broadband, because of the super information highway, everyone is a journalist, everyone is a social media expert. 
what has occurred during this time for me in terms of viewing media, and I'm a, a talk show news outlet junkie. I just love gathering the news and looking at how it's all spun and covered. And in my daily consumption of that, what I've come to realize is when I listen to friends, family, and just my neighbors, when we start to talk about the things that are being shared, especially during COVID-19, and the information that is spun through outlets and sources around COVID-19, you start to ask, what was your source? Where did you get that information from? And it just kind of imploded for me that social media and media outlets that might come from Comcast or might come from um, internet platforms you, there's no filter now. There's no um, integrity check. There's no way of knowing the critical validity of this piece of information you have, you know, been given. Mm -hmm. And with the monopoly and the capitalism of just a few people owning everything, and one understands how media is actually done. If Rupert, Rupert uh, Murdoch wants to say, "I only want you, my staff, to do this," then that's what staff does. Because anyone who understands media knows that whoever owns it gets to control the narrative. They get into the editorial boards, into those rooms, and they decide what the story is going to be, who's going to cover it, who's not going to touch it, and what you're not going to talk about. So COVID-19 period has become scary because of the whole ideas and information around the vaccine. Where is the information coming from? I mean, being a student at Antioch, I've sat in a classroom where a professor has actually said what news sources we were to use. And as a Black American person, I was somewhat offended because there was no Black news um, outlet on the list. There was no, you know, there was no Ebony Magazine. There was no Jet. No, there was no mention of the Afro-American. There was no mention of any Black news source. So that became um, an issue for me. And I don't want to go on and on about this, but I'm just, what I'm trying to, to look at in this moment when we talk about race and media is who is the media and how is the media talking and affecting race in America? You know, we just saw how people covered the border incident with the Haitian people. Mm -hmm still traumatized by that, you know, because media was not only the everyday man with the cell phone, but media was NBC, CBS, and major what we call mainstream sources that showed the world this. And so then it, it begged to ask you the racial questions <laughs> because those were black people, you know, mm -hmm. we saw months and months and months of Latinx people, you know, at the border but they were not suddenly rushed away and harassed with horseback, you know, patrolmen, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going off on a tangent now, so forgive me. No, it's a, you, you know, how does one find the integrity now since we have this, this internet, the super information highway that's exploded into this all whole other uncontrollable beast mm -hmm. that we now yeah. have to catch up with the legislature to mm -hmm. control Oh, and to make it more palatable for the everyday man to use his voice. Yeah. That's, thank you so much, Clarence, for that. I mean, a few different things that it makes me think about. You know, for starters, I think that there are obvious, and this is true both in the platform space, but also with kind of mainstream outlets of media, there are financial incentives here um, across the board for the perpetuation, for the lifting up of certain narratives and the downplaying of certain narratives or the, the visibilizing of certain people and the invisibilizing of certain people. Um, you know, AT&T was, has financial ties to the, you know, One American News Network, you know, which is that deeply right-wing conspiracy theorist like news outlet that gained prominence under the Trump administration. Well, AT&T is one of its financial backers, you know, um, and that, that only recently came to light. Um, Facebook for, years, and I'm, I'm saying as far back as probably 2011, has known that hateful content is 
much more effective in driving engagement on their platform, like driving clicks and shares and all that stuff than any other kind of content. And, you know, the financial incentive there to allow hateful content, to allow the rise and the organizing of, you know, white supremacist, white nationalist groups on their platform, like they have allowed this to happen um, in very, you know, in very intentional ways. You know, you saw this in the growth of like, stop the steal groups that emerged right around the 2020 elections. There were no stop the steal um, Facebook groups prior to, you know, November 6th and afterwards, it just ballooned and their membership ballooned with it. Not because, not because people like got upset at the results of the election and turned around and said, I'm gonna join a stop the steal group, but because they logged onto Facebook and Facebook promoted to them, here's a group you might be interested in. And that's not like, that's not, that, that's literally this, this platform providing the infrastructure for people to get organized. And what it led to is what we saw on January 6th. Like they facilitated the infrastructure for that kind of coordination, um, which led to insurrection. But, um, but for, for a long time, these platforms and these outlets have known this and they have the financial incentives to drive, you know, uh, to drive that kind of, um, that messed up behavior and, you know, and I think that to me, I think in terms of the response, um, I agree, like there is policy and legislation has not kept up with the innovation in technology and the impact that these technologies are having in our society. And we're left to try to like, you know, pick at the corners of a problem that's gotten immense and big. And there's both like no real legitimate infrastructure for information that exists in the United States. You know, we have you know, the kind of corporate, corporatized model of media. You have some public, public media, but not a lot. Um, and at the local level, at the hyper-local level in many cities, you don't have local newspapers. Um, you don't have any real kind of local media ecosystem that people can rely on to, to lean on, you know, diverse information. It just doesn't exist. So in the absence of that, people do lean to platforms like you know, the internet and look at Facebook as one of their primary sources of news. But that's a place where, you know, algorithmic amplification means that certain bad content is always going to be amplified much more than, than something else. Um, you know, following the January 6th insurrection, we, we met with Twitter and, and Facebook and, you know, our number one ask leading up to that meeting, but also uh, after the insurrection was, you have to ban the people who are amplifying the bad stuff. And their, their position was always like to, to kind of drape themselves in the First Amendment to say, we can't do that because you know, we have to protect all kinds, all free speech, even though, even the kind that we don't agree with. Um, even though you know, that free speech was systematically hateful and, and leading to real, you know, real world harms against you know, people of color. Um, and it took the insurrection for them to take action on, you know, driving someone like Trump off of Twitter and off of Facebook. Um, but one of the things that I think that we've been populating as an idea there is that these platforms systematically privilege the speech of some and, you know, and suppress the speech of others. And that's, that's not free speech, you know, that is a private platform manipulating speech in such a way to financially gain as much money as possible. Um, I, I just to, just to put it on a hopeful note, um, where I am hopeful is I do think that, you know, there is real opportunity in the near future to roll back change at the at the platform level, uh, at least to deal with the the internet ecosystem, the misinformation disinformation that exists on those platforms. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission has three commissioners; they're all progressive to left leaning. Two of them are, are people of color. Um, and they are interested in doing something real and tangible to really roll, to change the business model of these platforms. And I think you will see ideas like the breaking up of these companies come up in the near future as a real viable option. You will also see regulations that will deal with, um, data collection and try to kind of disrupt the, the extractive data model that these companies operate from. That's one hopeful thing, but I also am like, I'm in touch with a lot of folks that are also thinking about how to rebuild, um, you know, local news ecosystems um, in a way that does empower the kind of, you know, individual kind of individual journalism that you saw from people that are documenting, you know, 
police brutality, um, like the black woman who captured the video of uh, George Floyd, um, and uh, and trying to kind of lean on models to like populate more of those models because we do need to rebuild who the trusted voices are, and we do need to not return to but have live in a media ecosystem in which, in which we do have the versions of the Chicago Defender today, the versions of, of the, the kind of the black press that were burgeoning in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s. Like we need some sort of infrastructure like that, that our communities can lean on, um, you know, to go for those, for that information, for those trusted voices, because even with COVID as, as I think we've come to find out and the disinf not find out, but also know just from our lived experiences, in communities of color, and in particular in black black communities, there's a real lived experience that uh, that shapes, you know, hesitancy around vaccines. The real lived experience. It's a messed up racist history in the United States. Um, and how do you how do you honor that history in a way in which, like, you're also trying to promote, you know, uh, the the kinds of accurate right behavior for this moment right now. Uh, and, it, and it has to come from trusted voices, which is why, you know, simply follow, following CDC guidelines like that, that won't always work, particularly not in our communities that have, you know, really complicated histories, particularly on the on the public health front. But I appreciate that. Uh, appreciate all your comments, Clarence. They were all on point. Mm -hmm. Also, so I just wanted to, to jump in. Sorry, Clarence. I just wanted to note that we're past an hour. So uh, we usually continue the conversation past that, um, but we are at the hour mark, so that, that can kind of officially, um, you know, we're at the ending point. Um, but we will continue, and I want to pass it back, um, Clarence, if you wanted to follow up on that. No, I was just going to say to Stephen that I, I know that you're excited about your favorite president's new platform since you've kept him off of Twitter, you kept him off of Facebook. And so now he's using that $900 million you guys gave him to stop the um, election and he's creating his own platform so you can get real honest news. Aren't you excited? <laughs> right. Truth, truth social, I think he called yeah, it. That's what he's, yeah. <laughs> so I, I would like um I would like to also um wearing my uh educator hat uh here is is that um when I hear uh, this, this uh, very thoughtful voices like Clarence uh asking these important questions and I what can we trust? So that, that's part of the conversation that, that I've seen happening in our classrooms as well when we address these issues. And I want to point out that when we deal with media literacy uh, before the internet, the media literacy was some sort of a, like a checklist of everything that you do's and don'ts, like a careful with this, careful with that. And then a, a simple checklist, you can get away with it, uh, like a being like a protecting yourself, stuff like that. These days with the internet, because it's a networked environment, it's an ecosystem as, as Stephen has been keeping bringing it up, it's an ecosystem. So it is it is uh, retrofitting all these ideas are, 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 uh, are there, is, uh, are, are, are very hard to tackle. Uh, and then one recommendation that that uh, that that I share with my students, and uh, and that is, uh, you know, scholars agree with that, and, and people that, that 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 have been thinking about this for a long time, is this: we need to start addressing this issue of uh, understanding what's happening with uh, open uh, idea of, of, of a paradox mindset. Right. Instead of trying to find the ultimate truth or finding the, the actual actual reality, real reality, stuff like that, is to just learn when to step in, when to step back in terms of having this openness. And it's also known as robust knowledge to have this, okay, I can't live in this middle ground because I know that I'm going to be open and alert at the same time about the issues that are happening. So it's a more active role for us is to be aware that what is out there is curated by definition because it's in a screen or it's in a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a wave in a radio. So it's curated, we know it's curated, uh, but uh, if, if we keep this, this open and mind and alert mind simultaneously, that is part of the conversations we have in classrooms, help us going to the direction that Stephen was saying as well is, is that uh, not everything is, 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 is lost. There are tools that we can, that it can be used, but we cannot see the, the gold in the, in the, in the, in the 
precious tools that we can have at our disposal if we are not aware of the devil's bargain <laughs> that is there in every tool that we use so it's it's like uh, this is what it is this is our generation of the people that are alive in this context in this generation where we all are and share this is this is the hand that we have been dealt with the context that we are is interesting and is alarming at the same time uh, and then just like a big white uh, white eyes open uh so uh that's part of the the issue that be very alert that this is no longer kansas yes um and i think the the way you know media literacy week also is about kind of raising the um or pointing the light on how important this is within all types of education that this is you know a kind of new world and understanding media and how it works is um maybe not more important than it's ever been before but it's it's constantly changing and like so it needs to be integrated into everything we teach um you know because it's all being mediated through these new technologies um and i saw gabriel uh, brought up a question but i also know um you know we're past the time steven so i don't know if you're able to hang, I'll hang in a, for a about later. another uh, until 5 15 and then i gotta jump off because i have to record a, a podcast with with my friend oh, oh my god so, oh, no. next. Oh, what a day thank you so thank much you. Steven. Thank you so <laughs> much. oh my god <laughs> Uh, Gabriel had a question about uh, disinformation, which, uh, yeah, did you want to? Yeah, yeah. Sure. I could, okay, you read it already? No, you can, uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, earlier you were talking about um, kind of policies and legislation and censoring disinformation, and I was just, um, kind of like a red flag went off for me in terms of like what is defined disinformation. I think there are clear um, there are clear examples, but I feel like the media in itself is already kind of a form of disinformation. Um, it is a controlled um, disinformation that has its own agendas. So um, yeah, I'm wondering what the consequences of the censorship um, is and yeah, how that's being addressed. Yeah, for sure. And so just to contextualize it a little bit, uh, with disinformation we're talking about, um, we define it as information that is deliberately false or misleading, um, and it's often rooted in some sort of political gain or profit. Um, so, you know, take the, uh, you know, an example being like the stop the steal being an example of like kind of a coordinated disinformation campaign that's promoting a particular idea all with a political end and certainly i think like when we think about the wider media ecosystem those lines get blurred quite a bit but i think in in the online context like what we're talking about is where bad actors utilize um internet infrastructure to amplify um you know specific stories uh, to achieve a particular political uh, purpose. And oftentimes it's not just the idea around disinformation campaigns is to seed it online first and, and then to, to gain kind of legitimizers along the way. So can you get a bad idea spread and get an elected official to tweet about it or mention it? Can you get a news outlet to cover it? Um, those are all like ways in which you can take you know, a terrible idea, and then give it wider visibility. Um, on the, in terms of like regulations that would stem the flow of that, um, part of what platforms don't do uh, is they just kind of amplify by default, you know, and they amplify based on um, engagement metrics. And again, I think it's like, it's the hateful content, it's the content that causes rage, it's the content that's fear-based that drives the highest engagement. So the algorithms on the, on the platform side are not like linked up in any way to like stem the flow of information that platforms like Facebook know is wrong, um, but won't do anything around it. So there are tweaks that you can do to the technology to add kind of greater friction points to prevent like really bad stuff 
from amplifying um, and from having the reach that it has. Uh, and so there's things that like platforms like Facebook have, you know, rejected or really um, not tried to do, like eliminate the share function on, you know, bits of information that you know is like disinformation um, that is knowingly coming from bad actors. And also these platforms can look on, you know, the, the metadata in the content that's being shared and see like patterns in behavior and coordinated attacks. So there's there's things that platforms can be doing more of to like stem the flow of really bad information from spreading. Um, and that those are the kinds of tweaks we're looking at. It's like, where can we add more friction into the point so that you don't get to a place now where conspiracy theories are at the core of like political ideas, you know? Um, and then I think you had another question around uh, monopolies in the media, you know, are they controlled? Um, and is this in reference to like how I was talking about AT&T where they were a regulated media, natural monopoly? Today, like monopolies, and there aren't really monopolies, it's more like duopolies. Um, they're not heavily regulated, um, you know, at all. So, um, you know, since the, since the 96 Telecom Act, um, one of the things that happened at that time period was if you used to be a newspaper prior to 96, you weren't allowed to also own a TV station. You weren't allowed to, you know, you weren't allowed to own, you know, the entirety of the media ecosystem that you operated in. After 96, you could. And that's how companies like Comcast emerged um, where they were both a cable provider, but now they were also an internet service provider and a provider that provided cable to people and actually owns a lot of the channels that they deliver to you. You know, prior to 1996, you weren't allowed to do that. And so today you have these kind of like multi, you know, multimedia conglomerates that exist because there are, there's no regulation saying you shouldn't own the channels that you deliver to people. Um, and it's gotten even more complicated today. Now you have, you know, uh, companies like AT&T that also own HBO and they have financial incentives to, you know, to drive you towards HBO content and drive you away from other competitors. Um, so, so yeah, they're, they're not really regulated at all. I think there's, you know, one of the things we believe in is there's a real need to kind of break up ownership in this space and decentralize ownership. Um, because when you decentralize ownership and you break stuff up, it actually leads to more diverse ownership, more diverse content, more diverse voices. Um, so that's some of like what we would support in this arena around uh, media monopolies. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. Um, it is 5.15, so I know you've got to run. Um, really appreciate you spending time with us and sharing your knowledge and all the great work you're doing. Yeah, for thank, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Very valuable for, for our own understanding of the, what's happening in the front lines of, of intervention and understanding the historical elements that you brought up. So, so valuable. Please uh, keep enjoying your day. Wish you a lot of stamina to make it all the way to your dinner time. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you all so much. You can keep track of our work, mediajustice.org. We're also Media Justice on Twitter. Um, and yeah, I invite you, if you want to learn more, sign up for our online action list, you'll receive information, action alerts, and all that sort of stuff of, you know, to, to know what we're up to. Uh, take care, y'all. Thank you so much Thank for this conversation. Thank you so much. It was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, we still have a few people on, but looks like we've wrapped up. So thank you, Rosa. Oh, putting this all together thank and, you, thank and you messy for conversations both. team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I really want to uh, thank both Rosa and Asa for uh, bringing Stephen to us and just such a high level informative conversation about these issues. Um, and so thank much, you. so much appreciation in the in the in the chat from so many people. I agree. And I also think like as pertinent as this to our lives, I think the lack of questions has to do with we just don't know where to ask. Like it's so exactly. overwhelming. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That, that is the, yeah. the thing here. That is, uh, there's a, uh, we're on uncharted territory. Yeah. And it's pretty weird and pretty scary. And, uh, but we are together. So that gives us a little bit of comfort that, okay, <laughs> let's walk this this uh, path, right? But it's uh, but it's pretty 
pretty awkward. Yeah, and it's this is an interesting link to Sophia Noble in a in a few weeks too. Like, it'll be really good to kind of continue this conversation, and I'm wondering how we can do that kind of pointedly. And David will be in conversation with Sophia, so I'm sure he'll take from this into that. That's a that's a good point. I couldn't say anything. I'm sorry, I was cooking, but that was a good point because. A lot of the questions that I have for him also apply to her. Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious as this conversation stretches out and goes into, um, you know, from the marginalized community to the information that we're receiving to, you know, the thing that gets me is you're doing this so social justice on a platform that is endless, you know, and they keep saying they're going to fix it and they keep saying they're going to stop it, but yet it doesn't have an end once you tackle something, somebody's going to be out there to write a new code that's going to allow it to continue. And it just, it just makes you wonder, like, is there a way to even, is there a way to turn off the plug, <laughs> basically unplug it or whatever? Yeah. I don't know. That yeah, was great. I think, I, oh, thank you. I'm, I'm um, appreciative, Rosa, kind of breaking it out into those different categories because I think that was really helpful because it is such a topic that um, you kind of have to take this really broad view because it's so interconnected with like built infrastructure and information literacy you know like they're combined but breaking it out to those categories was really helpful I thought um, and I, I hadn't thought about it in those exact terms either. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad that it's helpful because uh, we we need to help each other to make sense of this wild west where we are. Which is, I wish it was a wild west because we would have a precedent, mm -hmm. right? Not even that. <laughs> it's just it's, it's it's pretty pretty awkward. Today was actually like a, a huge the Facebook papers coming out today. Like mm -hmm. there's you know a whole two hours of <laughs> stuff we could talk about just in that. So mm -hmm. it's like constantly. Mm -hmm. So, Asa, when are you and Mr. Trump launching your platform? <laughs> I tried What's to sign up. Date? What's your launch social. date? I, I think it's getting uh, taken down already. I, I was actually, <laughs> I he, he built it on um, open source software. I mean, not him, yeah. obviously, but whoever he hired. And it went against the terms of service of the uh, software developer who made the open so source software because they're not sharing their code. So there would be a legal basis to take it down. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> but it's also, it's yeah. going to be, Clarence, <laughs> in, the, in the language that we have been using lately, is is going to be the first example of an official eco chamber because it's going to be just having like a bubble uh, of, uh, of single minded uh, and single stories. And, and it's going to be uh, feeding itself from the single story. And uh, I wonder what, how that digestion is going to go. Like, it's going to be interesting implosion. But there are these subversive pranksters who are also <laughs> in, in the, 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 the echo chamber. And they're making a lot of mayhem, as, a, as I understand. I haven't seen what it looks like. But mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether aces got some pranks up his sleeve <laughs> <laughs> well i think i i think it ties it's like uh, i really like thinking about it uh, as a continuity historically like there have always been people sabotaging the technology that you know exploitation depends on <laughs> like that's what the luddites were originally you know they were breaking the <laughs> I beat Lisa to it. <laughs> um, you know, so people who understand code or can get into here, like jamming some stuff up in the gears, you know, it's yeah. one of the advantages um, to the fact that I think the people around Trump don't understand these things. So that's a, even more incentive to learn them ourselves, you know. Well, I plan to join the platform, but on my profile, I'm going to use a picture of Asa. And make <laughs> Asa Trump Thank you. It's going to be really good for, for my uh, social I think with your there. beard and your hair, I'll fit the profile just, just good for the good old boys. So. <laughs> yeah, just... <laughs> 
You might have to make You're me look a little less, less Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. That was, he was fantastic. We have to bring him back. Yeah, he was terrific. Yeah. And Ro time. Rosa, you set it up very beautifully yeah. also. And, and thank you. I thought he, I, I, he went in so many directions that I wanted to know more. I want to know more about whether there's any move to break up these monopolies. Mm -hmm. you know, like he brought that up at the end, but that's what was on my mind is, is there any chance? I mean, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are there are very interesting actions right now uh, and uh, interventions that that are being uh, prepared and uh, so. But but it can be a continuing conversation. I was talking to Asa about this that uh, the media is is is, uh, is is part of our lives. It's part of our social world, economic world, uh, personal world. So the media is so part of entrenched that that it would be important for us to keep on the table this topic of of media literacy and access on all the different elements of it uh, on our campus with our colleagues or with our university so uh, keep bringing it up and then with steven i have ulterior motivations i told asa i want to have this this partnership for for larger issues like i bring uh, bring uh, faculty or bring bring uh, speakers uh, and I have internship opportunities and uh, stuff for our students to be in the real world with them. So I think this could be a long term relationship. He I think he he liked us too as much as we like him. So I think he appreciated us as a community. So we will keep it going. Kudos to you all for Thank doing you. this. Really yeah. great. Really nice job, Rosa. Really nice job, Asa. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Always thank you for opening the door. Thank you all. It was and great. Kirsten, I, I, I almost I, I, I live in denial, permanent <laughs> denial that you, you are you are here all the time. I'm so sorry I missed the first two, but I was traveling and I I I just was so sorry not to be there but this was fantastic it's as great as ever this conversation space this platform really rich so mm -hmm. she's bragging asa that she was somewhere where there was no broadband and no internet connectivity <laughs> exactly. she was she's bragging, she she's bragging living the dream <laughs> <laughs> no different times i think different they have times, it in though. berlin right <laughs> Yeah, well, four o'clock here is one in the morning in Berlin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not that I Berlin don't say it. Actually, they've done an a amazing job as a city of like keeping out some of these tech companies that were trying to move in, you know, build. Yeah. They got Google to cancel a, a headquarters, I think, right? Oh, wow. Yeah, I think I heard that. I'm going to find out more. And they keep the rent down? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> no, it's a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. Rents, yeah. Homelessness is a big problem there. Anyway, yeah. congratulations, everyone. Let's, I'll be joining you next week. Good to see you. Good night, everybody. Everyone. Bye bye. Thank you again. Thank you again. And then, uh, I don't know, Lisa, Lisa skipped out on us. Um, but that was great, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's very informative. We've opened another can of worms, but it's a very, very relevant can. And it, this is just a start. And I, I feel confident that we actually will continue with this conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and especially uh, in a couple of weeks, right? Yeah. Uh, You're we, right. We keep mm -hmm. this going. Topic well chosen. Very good. Yeah. Well, that's all Rosa. She figured this out. Yes. Yeah.